Okay, then uh, we come to next speaker. Um, I would like to introduce our next speaker. Is uh, who, she is uh, Mrs. Laura Korea uh, Chapa. Uh, I hope I pronounce correctly. Okay. Yes, please. Sorry. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think Laura advise company in relation to their sustainability strategy, full consultancy, the great swarm. And she is a very assistant professional with over 20 years of international experience in sustainability. That means not, not, not really in Hong Kong. Huh? No, okay. not only in Hong Kong. Okay. And, and um, okay, I, I think I, I know that you are also uh, working in the past, you also work in Paris and also in London. Like Paris, London, and uh, New York for a bit as well, and okay. Hong Kong. Then how come you come to Hong Kong? Um, <laughs> oh, very simple reasons. Yeah. I wanted to uh, continue to live with my husband. <laughs> oh, okay, 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 yeah, okay. Your husband is very strong, huh? <laughs> okay, anyway, I I'll pass it down to you, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, well, uh, so good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for this presentation focused on the SDGs as a roadmap to business opportunity. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is, as Felix just said, Laure Corignan Chabert, and I have to say I am particularly pleased to be here this morning and particularly thankful to the Green Council for inviting me, um, as I think this event and your virtual presence this morning speak really for the timeliness of the topic, um, despite or even perhaps because of the challenging times we are currently facing. Given the current context, it seems there has never been a better time to work towards a more resilient and equitable society that lives in balance with nature. Okay. I got it, sorry. <laughs> Just got it. So as Paul Hawkins, uh, environmentalist, entrepreneur, and author stated, if you look at the science about what is happening on Earth and aren't pessimistic, you don't understand the data. But if you meet the people who are working to restore the Earth and improve the lives of others, and you aren't optimistic, you haven't got a pulse. So in that spirit, the purpose of my presentation this morning is to provide you with both some data as well as examples of the inspiring work organizations, big and small, are doing to restore the earth and improve the lives of others as expressed in the Sustainable Development Goals. As you all know, the 17 SDGs form the core of the 2030 Sustainable Agenda. Sustainable Development uh, Agenda for Sustainable Development. The SDGs are really the blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. The goals are now on the agenda of most political and business leaders and are guiding more and more companies in the way they operate. An increasing number of companies understand that aligning their business strategy with the SDGs allows them um, managing reputational, operational, and regulatory risks, strengthening stakeholder relations, attracting and retaining talent, increasing supply chain resilience, drawing attention from investors whose values are aligned with their own. But the SDGs are also shaping the new business models of tomorrow. For um, forward-looking companies, they lay out quite a comprehensive roadmap to tackle the global challenges. And in so doing, they identify business opportunities ahead, which can lead to new um, revenue streams and growth. And I personally believe that the role of businesses today is not just to participate in delivering the goals, but really to lead the way as change makers. We will consider um, the SDGs through the lens of three transversal issues, um, namely uh, waste management, water management, and air pollution. And though we don't have time to look at all 17 <laughs> SDGs in detail this morning, 
There is one SDG that I find particularly pertinent in the context of the three issues I just mentioned, and that's um, SDG 12. Um, as a reminder, as a, SDG 12 aims to ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns, notably by ensuring the efficient and sustainable use of our natural resources. SDG 12 is really about doing more and better with less. It is not only particularly relevant to um, uh, businesses as improving resource efficiency can help a company uh, reduce its cost base and reduce its risks, but it is also um, a particularly important SDG, SDG as it underpins every other sustainable development goal from zero poverty to peace and justice. And if we look at the case of waste management, um, and more particularly uh, target four of SDG 12 on environmentally sound management of all waste, you can see that working towards one target has ripple effects on a number of other targets. Um, from target three of SDG six on improving water quality, um, to target one of SDG 14 on reducing marine pollution, and so on. You can see the effects are really numerous. So now let's take a closer look at the case of plastic waste management. And before we do so, I would like to share with you an anecdote. At a recent dinner party at the beginning of the coronavirus outbreak, um, when we were still allowed to gather, um, several guests suggested that we try to avoid using certain words such as virus, homeschooling, school closure, like in a taboo game, as these words triggered some anxiety. And somewhat to my surprise, um, one of the guests said that she wanted to add plastic and recycling to the list of banned words for the evening. So. <laughs> While I doubt any of you will deny the gravity of the problem, chances are that if you are here today, you know the problem of plastic is crystal clear, I do realize that some of you, like my friend, may feel they have heard a lot already on the topic. And, are here, and I really hear you. But the reality is that the problem of plastic waste is still one that needs to be solved quickly. And I would say now, even more than ever, given that with the pandemic, we have seen an increase in single-use plastics, from plastic bag to straws to plastic cutlery, even in countries where it had previously been banned. Like in France, plastic cutlery had been banned from schools and it found its way back in June when schools reopened. So to exemplify, exemplify the problem of plastic waste even further, I would like to ask you one question. Out of the estimated 6.3 billion metric tons of plastic waste ever generated, only 18% has been recycled. So um, I don't know if you can uh, answer by using uh, maybe uh, the, your, the hands uh, on, uh, at the bottom of, uh, or at the top of the, your screen. Um, those who think it is true, please don't hesitate to answer. Um, so those who think uh, it is true and those who think it is false, actually 18% is already a low figure, but it is half that. Out of the estimated 6,300 billion tons of plastic waste ever generated, only 9%, and by the way, um, that the 6,300 billion tons of plastic in terms of weight is the equivalent of 20 times the weight of the entire world population. Um, but only 9% has actually been recycled. So uh, most of you were right. <laughs> and 79% and ends up in landfills or littering um, our environment. Now, Plastic itself is not a demon. 
plastic can be a very useful material if exploited as it was intentionally um, intended, initially intended. Indeed, it is durable, versatile, and cheap. But the way we currently use it is wrong. It was originally designed to last, not for single use. Most plastic items are used only once before being discarded and often when ending up polluting um, the environment. And according to UNEP, nearly 50% of the plastic waste generated globally in 2015 was plastic packaging. And that is particularly an issue in Hong Kong. As, as you can see on the pie chart on the right, our use or our plastic waste is nearly twice global average. But addressing the issue of plastic waste can also be seen as an opportunity, which is what Adidas saw. As more and more companies find their purpose and innovate around ways to use business as a force for good, Adidas is collaborating with um, environmental organization Parley for the Oceans to tackle the problem of marine plastic waste. What I find um, particularly interesting in this case study is that the initiative was born from Adidas not only listening to its stakeholders and taking into consideration what NGOs were saying, but to go one step further and collaborating with one of these not-for-profits to tackle the uh, and find solutions against plastic pollution of the oceans. The German firm started developing trainers made of yarns and filaments reclaimed and recycled from marine plastic waste and illegal deep sea gillnets um, back in 2015. And they are now currently developing a 100% um, recyclable shoe um, called the Future Craft Loop, um, which can be returned to Adidas and broken down to make a brand new pair, um, enabling a circular manufacturing model where the raw materials can be repurposed again and again, but not just repurposed into another plastic bottle or a top bag, but into a brand new pair of running shoes, which I find quite exciting. Um, and two years ago, Adidas pledged to remove all plastic, uh, virgin plastic components from its supply chain by 2024, so just in four years. And here is the best bit. In 2017, um, Adidas sold 1 million pairs of sneakers made from, uh, made from recycled, sorry, made from a recycled ocean plastic. And in 2018, they sold 5 million pairs. And this year, they aim to sell between 15 to 20 million pairs of shoes, making it um, one of the company's biggest success stories. This corporate initiative um, to reduce plastic waste also, also contributes to multiple SDG uh, targets. Target five of SDG 12 to reduce waste generation, target one of SDG 14 to um, prevent and reduce marine pollution, and is also a great example of partnership um, in line with SDG 17. As Peter Diamandis, um, uh, founder of XPRIZE and uh, Singularity University once said, the world's biggest problems are also the world's biggest uh, um, business opportunities. And another example of upcycling and of a company turning the problem of waste into an opportunity is Orange Fiber. Founders Adriana Santanocito and Enrique Arena have developed a technique to turn disposed of citrus fruit byproducts into sustainable fabrics. The cellulose fibers are extracted from the leftovers 
of citrus fruit after pressing using their uh, patented process, then spun into yarn that can be used to make silk-like biodegradable fabrics. And that material can even blend in with other material. Um, and you can, um, in 2017, Italian luxury fashion house Salvatore Ferragamo launched the very first um, uh, fashion collection of printed shirts, dresses, and scarves um, with the orange textile. You can see an example of the printed scarf on the left of your screen. And last year, their innovation was included in H&M's Conscious Exclusive collection. Since this material comes virtually from trash, its manufacturer does not require exploiting any natural resources, um, thus uh, avoiding fertilizers uh, and environmental pollution, and also enabling to preserve land and water. Which leads me to our next issue, water management. Now, water is a contextual issue, being both localized and impacting businesses in different ways through a company's uh, operations, supply chains, and sometimes both. This makes water a highly complex and globalized issue. According to the OECD, a business as usual approach to water supplies will mean that half of the world will face severe water stress by 2030. And if current usage trends don't change, we will only have around 60% of the water we need in 2030. While the problem of water management is definitely complex, it is also one um, that can have significant positive impact if solved. For instance, the World Bank found that failing to implement better management uh, water management policies could result in GDP, uh, regional uh, GDP losses. Implementing efficient water policies could have a positive impact on regional GDPs. To allow you to um, better grasp the urgent need to improve how we use this precious resource, I would like to ask you another question. And please don't be afraid to answer, school is finished, it's not graded. Um, how much water does it take to produce one plastic bottle of water. So um, you can either uh, answer by, um, you know, entering no water is used, one bottle, three bottles, or, or five bottles of water, or by a color. I'll give you just a couple of uh, uh, seconds to uh, answer. So, okay, so um, it's generally three or five bottles. According to the Water Footprint Network, producing a water bottle, including the plastic container and the filtered water inside, actually requires five times the amount of bottle in the actual bottle. The amount of water, sorry, in the actual bottle. In other words, every liter of bottled water sold represents five liters of water used. Seems absurd, right? Especially when we know this that water is a finite resource. Now, to increase water use efficiency, companies could set targets for improvement in water management practices. They could monitor progress and disclose the results of their efforts in consistent and comparable ways. Businesses could also find innovative ways to tackle the issue. NOTPLA is one of these innovative initiatives that addresses the issue of water efficiency, as well as the problem of single-use plastic mentioned 
earlier. Pierre Pallier, a former packaging engineer at L'Oréal, and designer Rodrigo Garcia Gonzalez, began working on the concept in 2013 while they were studying at uh, respectively at Imperial um, College and the Royal, Royal College of Art in London. Now, seven years later, it is no longer a student project, but a viable business. When they started to think of a way um, to, of, of natural uh, materials to replace plastic packaging, they were inspired by molecular cuisine, as well as by the way nature encapsulates liquids by using membranes, from egg yolks to cells to fruits. So the company um, harvests brown seaweeds, from which they remove, obviously, the color, um, the odor, um, and the taste, to produce a thin, edible membrane that can replace plastic packaging. And the, the brown seaweed grows up to one meter a day and um, requires no fresh water. So the startup uh, partnered last year with Scottish uh, whiskey brand Glenlivet to produce a glassless cocktail capsule. Um, and that same year, um, their partnership with the London Marathon allowed to reduce by four the, uh, the amount of um, plastic bottles on the race. And um, they are also working with Just Eat to replace takeaway sauces with a seaweed-based um, uh, sachet. And as a side note, according to Planet uh, Plastic, um, we um, are using um, globally uh, uh, per year Eight, more than 800 billion um, plastic sachets, and very few of them are actually recycled. So I now invite you to watch a short video um, about this innovative initiative. So um, I haven't tried it yet, um, but apparently it's a bit like biting on a cherry tomato. You put it in your cheek, bite on it, and it explodes. And it's a great example of not just, tr just transforming our waste into resource, but making sure that our resources don't become waste in the first place. Now, before we take a look at our last transversal issue and inspiring initiative, I would like to remind you of an important fact. On one hand, as we all know, um, the Earth's resources are limited. 
And on the other hand, um, the world's population is continuing to grow and, expect, and is expected to reach uh, 9.7 billion in 2050. World population growth um, is sometimes referred to as the elephant in the room, as while it is not explicitly mentioned in the SDGs, it matters greatly. Um, indeed, it makes it more difficult to reduce poverty, um, improve uh, health, expand education. It means more people are exposed to natural disasters and environmental change. It also means um, a higher number of consumers and the related environmental impact. And when you put this predicted population growth in the perspective of air pollution, it does not bode well. Um, as I'm sure you've all read, COVID-19 has led to a respite in air pollution, starting from, um, with pollution uh, from road transport. As you can see in this chart, um, almost every major city has seen a huge drop in road use. And experts are estimating that global emissions this year will fall by around 5% of the global total in 2019. The largest ever fall of this century and equivalent to losing the entire energy demand from India. Um, so not a small country. But these drops in air um, traffic, in road traffic, and in industrial activity are temporary. And while the planetary breather is the largest fall in global emissions ever recorded, it is still nowhere near getting us to the 1.5 degrees Celsius target nations are pursuing under the Paris Agreement on climate change. Global emissions would need to fall by around 7% every year for the next decade in order for us to meet this target. So how can we align with the Paris Agreement and contribute to SDG 13? The problem is, of course, very complex, and it's not one that can be solved in isolation or with just one solution. It may also require enormous changes to the way we live, such as swapping fossil fuels um, for renewables, cutting down on flying, changing the way we heat or cool our homes, and changing the food we eat. We could also plant more trees, as plants and trees are important carbon sinks. And we could develop technologies that do the same job. And here is an example of such a technology. This initiative is probably one of my personal favorites, as a Gravity Labs turns what is often labeled as the enemy, carbon, into a resource and ultimately into something beautiful. On a trip home to India, um, from uh, um, his studies at MIT, a clever idea came to um, Anirudh Sharma. He thought, what if we could recycle the suit that is making our um, cities dirty and use the pigment to make something beautiful, like ink? And that is exactly what Gravity Lab does. They designed the car link, a small device fitted to the exhaust pipe um, that captures up to 99% of air pollution emissions from um, an engine without inducing back pressure into the vehicle. These captured pollutants are then transformed into ink. So let's uh, watch a video of a project that developed um, with Heineken in the UK taking pollution from the streets and putting it back into a transformed and beautiful way. Tiger came to me because they believed in bold ideas. They took our idea that started small and with the artists around the world, made it into a reality. My name is Anirudh Sharma and I'm in London right now to capture air pollution before it enters the environment. 
Ink's been around for 35,000 years, but it wasn't refined until the fourth century BC. 6,000 years later, what Tiger are doing with air ink is using the smuts and the poison and then put that into a, a solution, which is brilliant. And I wish I'd thought of it. So it's a little retrofit thing that fits onto the tailpipe of the truck and whatever particulate you see coming out of the truck, it'll now be stopped and confined into that chamber. As this fleet of trucks are driving around the city, they're collecting air pollution while delivering Tiger Bear. The technology is still in beta. The next step is to reach out to cities and governments of the world who can help take this to the next level. It's nice to be associated with a company that's actually doing something for the environment, reducing the pollution, certainly in central London because you feel it every day. It can only be a benefit for us all, really. This pen is approximately 40 to 50 minutes of diesel car pollution. We're transforming something negative into something positive. Then we put it back into the street. So in a way, it's a cycle, but the end product is different. I think the vision for the future for Air Inc. is less pollution and more art. So ingenious, right? Um, I would now like to conclude today's presentation um, by reminding you of an important point before you set about or continue your journey to align your business strategy to be consistent with the Sustainable Development Goals. Remember to engage your stakeholders on this journey. In order to do so, it is critical to set a narrative. You need to unite and rally your stakeholders around a set of common goals. Big stories are the most powerful way to engage people in what your business is for and where it's going. A story provides something beyond just figures and facts. It gives meaning and connection and makes your stakeholders um, characters of the company's story and not just bystanders. And according to Gallup, um, businesses with engaged employees are 17% more productive and 21% more profitable. The narrative, of course, will be different for each company, depending on who you are, your values, your cultures, your culture, your stakeholders, and their interests. Um, a fisherman may not know or be interested in knowing about climate change, but he does care about fish and marine life on reefs. Um, a farmer uh, will be interested in um, productivity, costs, and products with a little poison. So um, I started my presentation with Paul Hawken, and I'm going to end with Paul Hawken. You have to talk to your stakeholders about things that affect um, their life today. Solutions that mean better working conditions, greater prosperity, better housing, more diversity, cliche oceans. In, in other words, things that they care about and things that they care about today. Thank you. Um, with that, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me at the email address um, on your screen if you have any questions. And I would like to thank again um, the Green Council for inviting me today and hope you will enjoy what promises to be a very insightful seminar. Thank you.